Welcome to Time to Teach with Tammy, the podcast that gives tips, advice, and suggestions to teachers by your real teacher. So sit back and enjoy, and oh yeah, don't forget to subscribe. Welcome to episode 46. Uh, Today's episode is entitled, How I Walked Away from the Behavior Chart. So um, yeah, so in this episode, I'm going to be talking about how I decided to leave the whole behavior chart system that I had been using for years. Um, I've actually talked a little bit about it on... um, my episodes before but it wasn't really in depth and it wasn't it was more like a you know like maybe um a brief part of my episode but today i really want to go into it um so yeah i will be talking all about that today but before we get started let's open up with our wins and fails segment so when for the week um on the day that I am recording. It is, well, it's actually Sunday, so I'm doing this very early (laughs) in the week um, because my win is we are officially on spring break. And the wonderful thing about that is here, we always have two weeks for spring break. We always follow Semana Santa, which I guess would be Holy Week. Um, and then Semana Pascua, which would be Easter week. So our, our, we always have those two weeks off in relation to Easter. Um, and so our spring break always moves whichever way that Easter moves. <laughs> so it's always kind of different every year. But um, yeah, so we get two weeks. That is exciting. That is a win. Um, I'm very excited about that. We will be spending one of the weeks at the beach that is actually the second week because um, this coming week, I'll just kind of share something that some people do, not everyone does, but my husband's family does. What they do is um, they get a group of people and they take a pilgrimage, they make a pilgrimage to a a town called um, Talpa. And this is kind of, um, it's I guess would be religious, um, it's basically like a sacrifice. They're going to go see the Virgin. Um, and this is their sacrifice. They actually, this group of people, um, my husband typically doesn't participate in it. I mean, we participate in the fact that we drive there once they've gotten there. It takes three days for them all to walk. Um, and we will then on that third day when they're there, we drive to pick them up because they're exhausted. They've been walking in the, this intense heat. Remember, we're in spring now and down here where we are the spring is the hottest season it hasn't quite peaked at where it will by april next month um it will be at its peak but it's a very hot time so they're they will have walked for three days they leave today actually um i'm just kind of remembering and they um yeah so it's really kind of neat they they walk there for three days they obviously bring food and water and stuff and you know and then they go there and then they go to the church and they see um, the Virgin of Talpa. And a lot of times, many of them will crawl on their knees when they get from the entrance of the church um, to the front. So yeah, um, that's all just to say that this week, in the middle of the week, we will be going there so we can pick them up from their pilgrimage. And what we usually do do um it's hard to believe this is like my ninth year (laughs) my ninth year doing this I remember my first year I was like what is this what's going on because remember you know I'm from the United States of America 
um, I'm a California girl, so uh, yeah, when you go into another culture, it's just really kind of neat to see some of the things that they do, but you don't. Trying to make sense of some of the things, it's difficult because uh, you're, you know, you bring your own cultural perspective and understandings with you. And then when you like step out of that, you just have to like really understand things just don't, they just seem very different. Um, now, of course, it's my ninth year, so it all just like, yeah, this is just normal life, making that pilgrimage tulpa. But um, it is really neat to see, you know, because it's not something that I had ever seen before I came here. Um, but it is really neat to see and um, yeah, to be part of. So so we'll be doing that in the middle of this week. And then <clears throat> next week we will be um, going to the beach. We'll stay there. I think we, I can't remember how many nights we booked. I want to say four or five. So it's a good stay. For me, that's good because when you go to the beach, it's so nice. So nice. But um, you literally do nothing at the beach, right? You just kind of like lay at the beach. Um, <clears throat> we eat seafood all day just all day it's just like a very miraculous time because all we're doing is seafood and in my house we are seafood lovers I could eat seafood every day I feel like that's very Mexican too um, I could be wrong but all the Mexicans I know they're just like there's this thing with seafood I don't know why um, and it is very delicious here so I don't know if that's what it is but there's this thing with seafood um, and, um, but anyway, it's like this glorious time where we sit on the beach and do nothing but eat seafood. Um, and I don't have to worry about cooking for the whole time. But, you know, after like four or five days, it's, you know, you're kind of ready to go back and do something aside from just laying on the beach for so long. But it's for those four or five days, it's so wonderful. You're just literally doing nothing because how many times in the year do we literally do nothing very few times so it's nice to have those times so yeah those are my wins you guys and then fail for the week um i'm working on a project i'm i really can't go into too many details at the time but i'm working on a project and it is an elephant of a project it is an elephant i don't know what else i can say about that except it's an elephant and um, i have to keep reminding myself to take one bite at a time that's like one of my favorite sayings how do you need eat an elephant one bite at a time and I'm really having to remind myself because I um the size of this project is so huge that it can feel overwhelming if you kind of look at if you try to look at the overview of it it's overwhelming so I'm trying to be like okay step one this is what I focus on that's what what then the next step and just you know take it in bite size but it has I've been feeling the stress of it and I've even had I don't know if I've ever talked about this on on the podcast but I get like these ocular migraines not with pain I don't get the migraine with pain yes apparently you can get migraines that do not have pain I fortunately and what am one of them but when it comes on it's um like you have um your vision is impaired basically during the time you're getting this ocular occurrence and um it's like you see lights in your eye and it makes it very difficult to see it's almost like for me and I think there might be different shapes but it kind of looks like a kaleidoscope if you've ever looked through a kaleidoscope so that's kind of what I'm seeing it appears to be in my eye but the truth is this is neurological so it's actually in the brain it just um blurs my vision so it's it seems like it's in your eye but it's actually neurological it's in your brain um and I do feel like because of all the stress I've been going through um it's brought on this ocular um, phenomena that I that I deal with occasionally and I know some of my triggers are stress because um, I have tried to track like when this happens and it does seem to be like at stressful times but also I think lights seem to play something uh, a part in it like if I go from maybe like a darker room to super bright or maybe there's a lot of bright lights or they're like moving lights I don't know I feel like lights can possibly be it um 
maybe noise. I can't tell because I've had it a few times in the classroom, but I'm just like, maybe it was just, I was having a stressful day or maybe it's overstimulation. I'm also someone who, um, you know, I'm an introvert actually, which I think we know. Well, I don't know if we know, I know. And, um, sometimes the environment feels very overstimulating and I'm just thinking that that possibly is something to do with it. And then also I've noticed if I don't get enough sleep, times like that. Even when my schedule gets off, like it is very normal for me when I'm on vacation to start experiencing the ocular migraines. And I think it is because I can go to bed later than I normally do. So I know it's crazy that I have like this crazy bedtime during the year. I go to bed at 8.30, I get up at 4.30. But honestly, when I don't follow these schedules, I mean, I set up these schedules for me because I know health-wise, um, I really need it. But when I'm, when I'm not on those schedules, it's, you know, my body just goes whack. And, um, one of the things that can happen are these ocular migraines that I get. And I've had it twice now, um, over the weekend. I had it twice yesterday. I woke up and just first thing in the morning, as I woke up, I was trying to, you know, I was like checking Twitter and checking this and I noticed that I was having a really hard time looking at the screen and I thought oh I think it's coming on because that's the way it happens it's initially it's not very obvious what's happening I just noticed that my vision is starting to be blurry and it's usually if I'm looking at a screen I can tell that if I'm looking in whatever else I can't tell that until it it like it starts in the middle of my eye or it seems it does and then it expands out as a kaleidoscope until it's expanded beyond my my vision and then it ends and then sometimes I'm left with a slight headache sometimes no headache at all but it's never like a migraine in the sense of um other people who get painful migraines but it is still called an ocular migraine um Anyway, yeah, so I experienced that twice already yesterday and I was trying to figure out why is this happening? Yeah, I think that's why it's happening because of this elephant. Um, so I really need to remember one bite at a time. Okay, so we're already um, 12 and a half minutes into this episode. Let's get started. Okay, how I walked away from the behavior chart. First of all, before I even begin, I just want to um, preface this by... Um, explaining the genesis of today's episode. What happened was last week I was in um, a committee meeting meeting our, of our Safe and Peaceful School Committee. Actually, it was just a couple of us because we started the committee not last school year, but the year before and this, no, sorry, last school year. <laughs> Time flies by way too fast. It's hard to keep up. Um, but yeah, it was actually last school year that we started it and it's this school year that we hadn't really been active on it and um, we're, you know, we're kind of, uh, we want to be active on it. So we decided to just meet just a few members of the committee just to kind of discuss and see like, um, you know, we want to get this started. So talk about that, what we're going to do, some of our goals in the committee and one of the things that was brought up, actually one of the things that I brought up was, you know, I think that we teachers can be better at building relationships with our students. Um, and anyway, so that was something that I said because I really feel like in school that should be priority one. Priority one is not teaching. And I've talked about, I have talked before on the podcast that I'm just convinced that teaching is just one thing of what we teachers do um, and how actually we're in this profession where we have so many obstacles to keep us from teaching. Um, it's kind of the irony of what we do. But um, yes, teaching is important if you're an educator, but I really believe that we are in the people business. We are in this relationship business and that has to be number one. And um, anyway, so then actually I was asked to kind of maybe talk a little bit about this at our next staff meeting, which is going to be happening once we return from spring break. Um, and specifically I was asked like, you know, they are aware of the fact that I moved away from the behavior chart system 
and they would like us to sh- like me to share that experience. So actually, I thought, what better way to do that than make a podcast episode on it? And I think that would help me like process and kind of um, get ready for that. And then also because I realized I've never dedicated a whole episode to that. I have discussed this, but maybe not to the same depth. Well, actually, I'm, I'm, I will have 10 minutes to speak. So this will probably be more in depth than my actual um discussion on it. But anyway, that's the genesis of why I'm speaking about this today. But um, yeah, I do want to share this because I think if you are a teacher who has been using a behavior chart system, you know, whatever it is, I don't know all the systems out there. I specifically with someone who used like a spotlight system, spotlight stoplight system, and um, So I would have like the green, you start your day on green. And the way I did it is I, my kids have clips with their numbers, like, um, you know, like what are those clips called? Like hang, um, hang where you hang your clothes, clothes pins. That's what I'm thinking of. And, um, so they have their number and then they just clip their number. Um, well, it just stays on green, but then if they're moving up or down, because when I was using it, I also wanted them to be able to move back up. Like just because you make a poor choice doesn't mean you have to stay in that poor choice. You can redeem yourself, make better choices, move back up. So they would just move their clip. So it was kind of like a color, you know, like one of those stoplight clip systems. I don't know. That's what I used for years. Um, I think from the beginning of my teaching, because it was the system that I knew of. It was a system I was familiar with. Um, it's the way that I'd seen things done before. So I just thought, well, you know, I will do that. But over the years since I've used it, um, I've not been convinced that it totally works in terms of helping to regulate behavior. And the reason why I haven't been convinced of that is it just seems like, you know, your kids who always stay are on green, always stay on green, right? They don't need to actually see their clip to stay on green. They know their clip is there. They are always on green with or without the clip being there. They're just, they make, you know, they are the ones who are always just making those kind of choices. The ones who move seem to always be the same ones who move their clip down, right? Like the kids who struggle with making the um, choices that would keep them on green are just, you know, the tip tend to be the same ones over and over again. So all of that is to say that they're always the same ones who are going to be moving their color. So that alone makes me wonder is the system working if the same ones are always moving because typically you would imagine that the the idea behind that would be that you know it's helping them to regulate their behavior if they're moving down they no longer want to move down so they're trying not to move down yet they continue to move down so are is that is that even is it effective or not i don't know and when they do move their clips down they are the ones who, you know, it's just like, it's kind of displayed for everyone to know that they made a poor choice. I mean, even I think if we do our very best to be subtle, everybody knows who has moved their clip down. You know, they just know. Um, Everybody knows who has ended the day on red and it's like the big topic, I think. Um, not that I, not that they're sitting there talking about it, but I just know if you go down the hall, sometimes you catch their conversations of, oh, so-and-so was on red. Um, and they go home and they tell their parents because the parents will start asking about the system, you know, like more information. When I used it, I would always talk about the, the chart, but then, you know, they only, I think they don't, you know it's new for them so they may not totally get it and that's why they start having questions later as they start hearing more information you know like tell me more about this or what does this color mean again and whatever so the kids know even if we're trying to be very subtle and not make a big display about it they know who has moved down they know who is on red and um 
I always tried to use those opportunities of when a child moved down and they ended the day on a certain color, specifically red, to have them reflect, okay, why are you on red? And sometimes they remembered, but many times they did not. So again, that made me wonder, well, how effective is this? If they can't even remember why they moved down, um, how much can they really reflect on it? You know, so that was another indicator that maybe this method is not the very best method. And then um, a third thing that was happening to me was that, you know, when you have a child, because I think inevitably, we will have students who will tend to, you know, they might be the ones to try to push the limits. I've had kids who like in the beginning of the school year, as they're getting to know everything, they'll really start testing things and or push the limits. And typically that's because it's the new school year. They don't know me. We really haven't established a relationship. So they try to see how much they can get away with because I think some personalities are just going to be that way. Um, so in the beginning, they might, you might see a little more flared up, um, behavior than later once you've established, well, everything really, but your relationship with the student, but also the routines and everything. Um, and so they might be the ones who are moving down quite a bit. And, um, a lot of times when it is a student, like let's say a student who just really has difficulty. And in our grade and pre-first, the, the difficult behaviors are really going to be um, played out a lot as, you know, maybe disruptive because they do have a hard time sitting and listening, which is why I try to keep my teaching, my quote unquote teaching time, which is maybe where I'm actually speaking. I keep that very short because attention spans are very short at this grade level that I'm in. Um, so yeah, so you might see a little bit of disruptive behavior, um, off task behavior, things, things of that nature would be, you know, misbehaviors in, in pre first. Um, and then, so if you're having a child who's do, you know, demonstrating those kind of behaviors a lot, they're moving down a lot, a lot, and it's being reported at home a lot. And what I get when you're dealing with a child and then their parents, maybe have to call them in for a meeting. Um, they mention a lot, of, they talk a lot about the red, about being on red, the color system. It, it just tends to be something that is hyper focused on. And then the parents start getting, you know, very frustrated. I've had a parent before say like, you know, I'm done with the colors. I can't, I, I can't do the colors anymore. And I get it. I mean, they just, it was like so much of, I'm, I'm, I'm on red today. Oh, I'm on red again today. I'm on red today. I'm on red today. I'm on red today. And um, it just becomes overwhelming and so, so negative. And I know that we teachers have the best intentions. I don't think we're trying to make it negative. We're trying to use it in a way that it can be positive, but it can seem overwhelming. Um, and then I also just feel like the poor kids who are moving down, like, I think that feels shameful too, you know, like when they go to do the walk of shame of having to move their color down, it's like announcing to the whole class that they've somehow messed up or made a mistake or made a poor choice. And it's on display for everyone. Even if you have it in a play, I always kept it behind my door, but certainly as you're like walking out the door, it's in view. Anyone who really wants to sit there and examine it could if they wanted to. And you do actually get those kids who are like, hmm, let's see, who moved down to yellow? Who's down on orange? Who's down on red? Um, you really do, unfortunately, have kids who are very interested in that if they didn't already, you know, like witness something happening. And so I just for a very long time felt like I don't like this system, but I don't know what else to do. So for the last many, many years, I mean, I feel like I've probably been wanting to walk away from it for five or six years and just for lack of not knowing what else to do like what do I do if someone misbehaves and I can't have them move down my whole world is out of stop like I really couldn't see past it um and I feel like there might be other teachers who are in the same position so it was at you know it was this school year that I said I don't 
want to participate in this anymore. I don't want not knowing what to do be what stops me. And I actually was like really struggling because I don't mention the behavior chart initially when the school year starts. I usually wait until maybe like the end of the first week. I mean, it kind of depends. I have to feel out what's happening in the classroom, but I don't start off with it because I do and intentionally because I always feel like it's kind of negative and I don't want to start with that. So I don't even bring it up. So I actually this year went a whole week and I hadn't brought it up and I was like, oh, I really like not having to um, do the behavior chart. That was so nice. Um, and then week two came along and I started thinking, can I keep this going? Can I, you know, can I put this off? Can I not uh, do the behavior chart? And then I started discussing with um, the Spanish teacher and we we tried to look at ways that we could, you know, be subtle with the behavior chart, but we still at that point were kind of like, oh, we didn't know if we could really felt like we were ready to walk away. So in the end, we're like, well, we're probably going to keep it and, and use it, but we'll just be kind of very subtle about it. And when we have a student move down, we'll just like, it'll be quietly disclosed to the child, you know, not something that is stated in front of everyone. Um, and so, but I was still conflicted, you know, like, okay, so that was the plan. But I said to myself, like, I'm just still not a hundred percent convinced that I want to do this. So I thought, well, what do I do? And then as I just started researching and reading online and really came to the conclusion that I don't need to have a system for that. I don't need to do anything in its place except what I'm already doing. If I just focus on, because when a child moved down, there were still, you know, consequences in the classroom. Um, and I thought that's what I need to focus on. First of all, I need to build the relationship with my students. I want them to want to make good choices. So that needs to be a priority. And then I need to continue to focus on consequences that make sense to whatever behaviors that might be happening. So even, you know, like in the past, they might move down and they might have to, you know, like, oh, you, you know, you've had this warning or you had, you know, you, you're, you're just playing with the crayons. So now you've lost the privilege of, of using the crayons. So these are still consequences, but instead of having the child move down, they just take the, the consequence and then it doesn't need to be on public announcement to anyone. So I decided I don't need a, any other system. I just work with my students and as consequences or as behaviors occur, they would have a natural or a logical consequence that makes sense to it. And then if someone's having a really, really difficult day and they've had multiple opportunities or just it was a really rough day, I would still reach out and let mom and dad know, you know, and I decided I think that would be the fairest thing to them because, you know, at the end of the day, moving your color down, what does that even tell you, you know, like what you have them move down, what did they learn from that? And did they change the behavior? Did that actually get to their behavior? So, so I walked away from it. And um, even though I had kind of decided, okay, I'm going to use it, but subtly, I couldn't bring myself to use it. I just cannot bring myself to use it. I just didn't feel like it was needed. And then I went weeks and weeks without using it and then discovered that my prediction of of thinking that I could do it without, you know, I could run a, a successful, well-managed class without it proved to be true. So I wanted to share this story because I feel like in many ways, we are 
may be bound by what we don't know how to do anything differently. And if you are like me and you've been using a system like this because you don't know any other way, I want you to know that there are other ways to do it. We don't really need a system. You know your students. When there is a misbehavior, you act accordingly. You um, give a, a consequence that makes sense in context, right? It, um, it makes sense. And this is not to say that I don't do anything else. There are things that I do in my classroom that I think could kind of be considered a system. Like, you know, we do, we earn group points for getting ourselves ready in time. Um, and this, you know, with my group points, they get to participate in Fun Time Friday if they have 30 group points. And sometimes the groups don't have 30 points and then they don't get to participate and they work on and finish work. Um, so I think in many ways this is kind of almost like a system too, but it's not so much attached to behavior. It's more like, you know, I'm working well in my group or I'm getting myself ready on time. Um, so there definitely are other things that are happening in the classroom. But in terms of having to have a, a color system, a stoplight system that announces who has made poor choices, it, I just, it hasn't been necessary. I walked away from it and I don't regret it. I'm so happy because then when there is a behavior, I just privately speak with that student and um, we discuss the behavior. We try to get to like, you know, what else can you do? And I feel like at most times it's very, very effective. You know, sometimes you do have a student who is possibly, um, you know, going to push the limit or who's having a bad day and it can be difficult and challenging, but you just look for those, those consequences. But I believe the number one thing that we should be doing instead of focusing on things like color coded behavior systems is building a relationship with our students. Um, taking the time to stop and listen. And in my grade level, pre-first, they're very young. They come in, they're typically five or six. The majority of them are five, um, turning six, but then we do have a few who are already six and they later in the school year start turning seven. Um, so typically five or six years old. And um, a lot of times it's it's a tough age and they don't know how really well how to regulate behaviors, emotions, deal with conflicts. So I feel like they really a lot of times just need to be listened to and guided through a lot of their issues um, and things that happen. And it's a constant, I feel like it's what we do as pre-first teachers. It's like, it's very constant. Um, but when we invest in making sure that we listen to them, try to find out what the struggles are when we see a behavior, try to really understand it because sometimes it's, you know, maybe because the material is difficult or maybe they're having a really bad day or maybe something happened in the morning before school or maybe something's going on with a friend. And it's really difficult to find the time to do that, but I do feel like that has to be our number one priority is investing in these relationships, letting them know that we care. And then when we do that, I think the classroom better runs itself. Um, it won't be perfect. I mean, there's always going to be things that happen, but I do feel like the respect level is going to be there. And when the respect level is there, they really want to behave for for the teacher, for you, um, because they respect you and they know that you respect them. So um, that's it, you guys. That's all I really want to talk about is how I walked away from the behavior chart and um, yeah, just decided like I really need to focus on logical and natural consequences and invest in the relationship with my students. They just really need to be, you know, listened to and taken that time. And I think we can... Um, affect really good changes in the behaviors in our students when we invest in that way. So that is it for today's show. It's wrapped.
episode 46. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'd love to hear from you. How do you manage behavior in your classroom? Do you have a system? Have you also walked away from a system? You can tweet to me at TammyJ123. That's T-A-M-I-J-123. I'll see you next time. Wait a minute. Wait one minute. Before you go, don't forget you can catch our show notes online at www.timetoteach.libsyn. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. We're also on Facebook at Time to Teach. Don't forget to check out our Facebook group, Teachers for Effective Curriculum. And if you're an educator with your own podcast show, I invite you to join our brand new Facebook group, Teachers Who Podcast. Let's grow a community where we can network, problem solve, and discuss anything and everything podcast related. I'll see you there.